Pokemon Scarlet is a brutal game in both difficulty and parental trauma. So when I decided to Nuzlocke it, I had to ask myself a few questions. What the hell's an encounter? When does the run in? Why won't she call me back? So I spin a wheel for encounters, the run ins at the champion, and she doesn't call you back because you're pathetic! <clears throat> so after sending Normie Girl off to prep school, I chose Fue Coco as a starter and named it Pybro, since I have this thing where I always name my Pokemon in runs after recent subscribers, and hey, maybe a Pokemon named after you could die in the next one. And if you ever want to see the journey live, I did this in terms of other challenges runs that you haven't seen yet live on twitch.tv slash alpharest so feel free to check it out because there's a good chance i'm probably live right now but back to the game our first battle of the run starts with nimona and the only way you could possibly lose to this is if she pulled out a gun luckily she didn't so now it's time to start catching pokemon when it comes to scarlet and violet nuzlocke encounters are a bit tricky as of now since you can't just blindly walk around given that these are static spawns so i would just write every local pokemon's name down throw on a wheel and let lady luck to side. And look, let's chomp. We named this one Nixie and found a Psyduck and a Gyarados to be on our way towards the first actual Nimona fight of the game. I know I mentioned earlier that you could only lose if she brought a gun, but in this battle, her gun's name is Palmy. I grinded for a bit on anything lower than my starter in the food chain to take out her assault rifle with two swift embers before making it through another half hour of mashing the A button. With the world finally opened up, I started heading towards the first gym since we're just ignoring Garvin and Penny this entire run. This is the wheel all checked out. Let's see what we got. Not a lot of high value picks here. And I guess I guess we take Sunker. I also ended up catching a Maskiff, but more importantly, a Fletchling named August. In its unevolved state, this Fireburst typing is only normal and flying. And yes, that will be important later. So as I just barely stay under the level cap at 15, that first gym badge is as good as mine, with Fue Coco on the field against Katie. Yeah, I think we're fine here. Yeah, he got oh my god. Well, we're safe. I mean, this Pokemon is broken. Alone, it takes out three gym leaders and half the Elite Four. So with a now evolved Pybro on our side, what could possibly end this run? Well, for some weaker trainers, apparently the second gym is a known run killer. But I had a secret weapon unlike any other. I noticed this grass gym and they have this terrestrialized Sudowoodo that has rock throw, which makes it difficult to sweep with a fire bug or flying type Pokemon. All three are super effective to grass, yet all weak to rock somehow. Normally, a Pokemon's terror type would be irrelevant here since it's usually a type that it already has, but with the Fire Flying Fletchender on our team, this whole gym becomes possible. Not because of the 4 FPS on Flora on screen, but because of August's Terra type is still normal, so I made sure to only spam Flame Charge for the first two Pokemon in hopes of outspeeding the slow tree rock, but then pulled the classic outhouse switcheroo by baiting in the formerly quad effective rock attack and sweeping with the diamond hat while spamming the fire move to secure the second gym badge. What a phenomenal strat we had there. That was good. That was a good gym. That's a hard one. That's an early run killer. Throughout all of my misplays over the years, it's nice to see some actual improvement. Does this gameplay look like the same person who nearly blundered a guaranteed win on Sabrina? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I mean... I, I mean, I hope not. Across the next few routes, I managed to round up some fodder, but most notably, a deerling named X-Filed, a watch roll named Space Ace, and a seemingly useless young goose that I somehow found value in. Given that Iono is not just a phenomenal streamer in her own right, but her team is tough this early in the game. Electric is a hard type to deal with in general, but it's too early in the game to have solid counters, especially for the bullshit that is Electric Levitate Miss Magius? What? I, I just, I feel so shaky going into this one. Eh. Eh. In hopes of finding a solution, I explored a bit beyond Lavincia and met Bum Eggs, the Makahita, who evolved near instantly. I know this doesn't sound like it would help me in the Electric Gym, but that doesn't matter because I forgot that there's a Nimona fight here and went in entirely unprepared. Ah, uh, this Terra is scary. Oh, he's Punk Claws. That could be scary. That could be scary in a different timeline. Let's just don't miss, don't miss, don't miss. Oh, he's on claws again. Oh, no. Oh, no. If this dude sets up on me, I don't die to plus two times two stab. Oh, something I do absolutely love about challenge runs in this game is that it feels so condensed given the multiple storylines. Nuzlocking through the champion path is essentially a glorified boss rush, and I utterly adore it. But when it came to Iono, I 
didn't really have a solid individual Pokemon for this fight, so I had to get creative. I brought back Nixie in hopes of taking out Iona's Watchel before putting her Belly Bolt to sleep, while surprisingly taking a good amount of hits along the way. So now it's time for Jojo the Young Goose to just be annoying and spam Sand Attack until he either dies or throws out enough sand for Hariyama to safely switch in. Given that I didn't have the tools to sweep naturally, I had to create a chain link of setup which allowed Bumex to bulk up against a Belly Bolt with blistered sand still stuck in all of its eyes. When Hariyama was finally bolted all the way up, because apparently this is a really good move, he proceeded to then knock out all of Iono's pawns until it was time to knock out Miss Magius in a single blow. But unfortunately, our plus five powerhouse became confused and damaged himself in confusion twice before conceding to plan B. Oh, wait, we gotta switch out. We gotta switch out. Oh no, don't, don't do it, don't do it. Yeah, okay. Knowing that Miss Magius Hex can't damage X-File, momentum was instantly restored as our loaded dice allowed for multiple bullet seeds to connect until that third gym badge became mine. If you can't tell, team building has become my favorite part about Pokemon, and I was constructing a new team from scratch for every single battle. The water gym isn't really one to be feared, but with a good amount of grass Pokemon in the back, I let my newly evolved Gyarados take the stage before clearing a path for Terrasilice and Flora, who just spammed the grass move and won. It's really Really funny comparing how much time I spent hyping up that last fight and then there's this one, but hey, not all of these battles are going to be interesting. Some of them are just clean wins in the bag, and if you've been counting at home, our total number of deaths so far is... Ah, oh, zero. Absolutely none. Things have gone genuinely phenomenal for me, and I'm not showing any signs of slowing down. Beating this Nuzlocke on my first attempt would be impressive, sure, but doing it accidentally deathless? Now that would be something special. A true testament to my growth as a Nuzlocker, and with a bit more pressure added upon my shoulders, an old version of me would say that's time to fight Larry, but this new version of me would say that it's time to prepare for Larry. In searching for new encounters, I happened to run into a Ghastly that I later evolved into a Haunter, and since my good friend Fyrus was in chat, he decided to trade with me so we could evolve into a Gengar together. Yeah, I can trade. Okay, Fyrus, I'm gonna DM you a code. So like, the main reason I had to trade with the friend was because I'm too scared about trading the Haunter to a random person because I think trading Haunter is the ultimate test of morality. It's like the true shopping cart test, right? Like, who knows if they're going to send it back? And I don't trust anybody in chat. We're waiting for the other person's decision. Okay. I'm getting worried. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did not just say thanks for the Gengar. And after some unnecessary negotiation on my part, I recovered Soda Fritz the Gengar and captured a Cyclozard to round out the team against the exceptionally ordinary Larry. Every time I fought against Larry, it's been a roller coaster of emotions because my Twitch chat always cheers for him instead. Knowing that Kamala was going to open with Yawn, I began prepping with Bulk Up, knowing that my held Lumberry would wake me up. I had a bit of a misplay here, forgetting that this would guarantee another Yawn, but I decided to adapt and just spam bulk up a couple more times until I fell asleep, only to wake up with a devastating force palm with enough for Dedun Sparse 2. I recognize that my plus four force palm was enough to strike down a flightless Staraptor, but here's the thing. I know I had beefy defense, but there is this voice deep in my head asking, am I truly playing around the crit? No. So I swapped out to Gyarados, knowing that his intimidate would drop the facade cannon's attack, only to swap in Gengar, who's completely immune to the very same thing, and I think you see where this is going. Yep, the lamest strat known to man. Stalling. Well, I guess it's a bit cooler than that since I'm actively lowering Larry's attack, but trust me, my chat was furious. So to finish the job, I swapped in the facade immune and freshly evolved Skeledurge to rob the people's champion of altering my active death count, which in case you're wondering, still remains at zero. However, we are not out of the woods yet as Nimona comes swinging immediately after Larry and I parted ways. She threw out Rock Dog against my Rock Dog Smasher and followed up with a Gumi weak to Ice Fangs, and as you'd expect, no, we did not keep the Gyarados out out against the electric rodent. But we did shed tail to safety while a weapon of mass destruction named Skeledurge spammed Torch Song and cleaned up the rest of the battle. I think the past two fights have beautifully showcased that, sure, you can have these super calculated fights, but in reality, the correct play is to sometimes just spam the strong move that probably kills. After grinding a bit and fully evolving our team, I trekked up the mountain filled with various encounters, all before engaging in the series of double battles right outside the sixth gym. Normally, I just go in with the previous team I had, but instead, I studied for this gym. 
like a nerd, sought out my best options and curated a team handcrafted by the gods for a gem made of ghosts. In the first battle, I used Mabelstiff's Double Dart Terra to take this first ghost's life before using Gyarados' insane attack stat to clean up the other with Crunch. And for the second battle, I pretty much just did the exact same thing, as if the first battle was a mere rehearsal. Our game plan didn't really change until Moist Critical decided to throw out a Drifblim who planned on going boom, which was the perfect time for our team to utilize a double protect strategy before double teaming his remaining Sableye. So with Rhyme taking the stage and reminding us that this game does not have voice acting, we get a brief moment to reanalyze the order of our team before immediately running it back with the exact same strategy since <laughs> why fix what's not broken? I utilized this dark powerhouse by intentionally killing off Rhyme's team one by one so her ace would come out alone. Knowing that the spooky Toxtricity was wanting to discharge the flying water snake, I knew it probably wouldn't even get a chance to hit, but in hopes of protecting the team, I threw in Cyclosaur as a D Decoy, but Mabosif may talk Tristy sleep with the fishes with a single blow, but hey, at least I was playing safe. Wait, at least I was playing safe? What? That switching was unnecessary, but I wanted to be safe? Instead of playing with an unnecessary risk, what is happening to me? I am in the middle of a deathless run on accident, but I am too far down this Poketuber tunnel to the point of becoming risk averse? No, 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 no. This can't be happening. That's like my thing. Where is the loyalty to the bid? Did, did I become everything I sought out to destroy? You either die a hero or see your self become the villain, and with the decorated path behind me, rising from the ashes from my own mistakes like a phoenix, oh god, I'm not the underdog anymore. I'm supposed to win. I'm not overcoming anything. In fact, I'm just beating a game made for children with an arbitrary set of rules. And by the time I made it to the seventh gym, Nimona wanted to test my resolve. Oh, we used Rock Slide. Oh. Oh, and we, we take Rock Slide. Oh, that's a problem now. She foiled my plan A opening with a rock slide flinch, and God, I know I'm trying to quit, but just one quick damage cal couldn't hurt, right? I safely swapped out into plan B safely, by the way, who properly weaponized his double damage earthquake before going back to Gyarados, only to be struck down by a critical hit on the way in. Well, <laughs> hey, at least I was playing around the crit range, right? Who am I? So then I pulled out my prepared plan C, because apparently I think that far ahead now, Hariyama bolts up to take out Sligu as we switch in Pupitar again for the Palm and Skeledurge for Meowth, I mean Delta the Pupitar and Piper the Skeledurge, these are creatures with names, and I'm only treating them like weapons of self-fulfillment? So with the final Nimona fight of this run concluding, it was time to visit the Psychic Gym for a much needed therapy session. Which one is it? Don't care. Got it. Nailed it. Tulip was a strong trainer, but I knew the limitations of my Gyarados. I, I, I mean, of Walnut the Gyarados. I knew the limitations really well, so I set up with Dragon Dance across multiple turns before sweeping her entire team by spamming either Crunch or Waterfall. With seven gym badges in hand, all we needed was one more, and the strategy could not be more simple. I slapped a Toy Scarf on the starter and tactfully selected Torch Song against each and every Ice Pokemon that Groove just sent my way. See, the Choice Scarf locks us into only being able to use one move, but it raises our speed past their entire team while Torch Song buffs the special attack after each use. I know it seems easy, but that's what makes it brilliant. I know even that idiot from my first one could have been able to solve this, but sometimes it takes a genius to appreciate the most simple of options. I mean, hey, this is my first attempt at a Pokemon Scarlet Violet Nuzlocke, and not only am I thriving, I am about to roll up to the Elite Four entirely deathless. So to raise the stakes a bit more, I'm going to do everything in my power to conquer the champion without a single death in the entire run. Not only to prove my prowess as a Nuzlocker, but to demonstrate the growth from simple mistakes and complicated solutions to exploiting complicated mistakes with simple solutions. I know that this isn't what I planned on ever becoming, but maybe it's time to face the music. It might not be so bad on top. So in preparation for the end, I trekked around the world, finding my final encounters for the run and developed a perfect team for everything ahead of me. All that's left is to turn this theory into reality, starting with Rika. Her Cash was a victim of Gyarados' flinching waterfall before doubling down as she sent out her sturdy Dawn fan. Knowing that I had a Stone Edge coming my way, I quickly activated Terrestrialization as a defensive maneuver to tank the hit while retaliating with another waterfall. And another. And another. And since this creature has water absorbed, we cleaned the rest of her team with just two Ice Fangs with Gyarados barely surviving. Oh! Oh! <laughs> okay. 
All righty then. Let's go for round two. <laughs> oh, that was close. But hey, that's a win, isn't it? Enter Poppy. Steel-type Pokemon can typically be frightening, but little Poppy had no idea what genuine heat the Skeledurge would have coming her way, as I utilized the exact same strategy as fighting Grusha and swept Poppy with the utmost of ease. Of course, next comes Larry, and despite my entire chat rooting against me, icing out my new Cloyster and opened with a Shell Smash to buff all the stats that matter before sweeping every single bird in my path with a guaranteed 5-hit Icicle Spear thanks to the fortune ability of Skilling. With one final dragon wielding elite four member in my path, I just did the exact same thing and swept his entire team. Yeah, sure, Cloyster was on the brink of death, but I ran the calculations in my head and knew that we were never actually in any real danger. With only one trainer left in front of us in this accidentally deathless run, I knew I was one fight away from ending it all. All of the doubt that people have formed against me, all of these reaction videos where people get to point and laugh, <laughs> and all these other creators who took four attempts to beat the game deathless, I was about to prove everyone wrong with one final battle. <laughs> so can I beat the champion of Paldea without losing one single Pokemon? After my military named Gyarados knocked out champion Gita's Espathra, she swiftly sent in King Gambit. In any other run, I would sacrifice Gyarados here as this is the last battle and all, but in order to protect the deathless run, I decided to swap in Cyclozar to take the hit. But... My plans of safely swapping with Shettail came to an abrupt halt when Gita landed an incredibly crucial critical hit. It shouldn't. Oh, the crit. I, I can't Shettail now. That crit ruined my whole plan. Oh, I should have just set up. <sighs> okay. Time to move to plan B. After running a couple calcs, I took a hefty amount of damage, but still hung on enough to fight back with a terrestrialized flamethrower in order to incinerate her Iron Grim Reaper. Next up was Avalug, who could have easily fallen victim to Skeledurge, but given that this was the perfect and deathless run, I had to protect him and baited out an earthquake as I swapped to an immune talent flame. Uh, but, but, but now what? I just replaced a special attacker with the physical attacker against a physically defensive tank. Uh, uh, uh oh. In hopes of keeping this Deathless run alive, I have accidentally put my own back against the wall. So maybe it's time to let go of this Deathless dream and instead face the music. God, dude, God! And it's a crit. Skeledurge comes in to clean up the Avalug that he could have already cleaned up many turns ago, but that's not what happened, is it? Instead, we now have to swap in this Cyclozar who U-turns out the Psychic Fish before the Pokemon that I never thought would see battle came out on the field and finish off both Veluza and Gogo. -Go. Now, with newfound blood on my hands, all I had to do was defeat Gita's final Pokemon. In our Jump Pluff's dying breath, it took half of Glamora's health, but sadly was not enough. But when it came to Gyarados, he just wasn't fast enough. And just like that, half my team has now fallen. This can't be how it ends. An otherwise perfect run ruined by just a few simple mistakes. Cyclozar got one last hit, activated Glamora's toxic debris, and then bit the dust as my only way out of here alive was... Wait. Never punished. Never punished. Wait, there's poison damage. And that was the cruelest emotional roller coaster I have ever experienced. If only I didn't attack with Cyclozar, if only I didn't make those bad switches, if only I didn't have to send out our beloved Skeletor named Pyro, maybe we had a shot. <laughs> And that's how I lost my first Pokemon Scarlet Nuzlocke. A seemingly deathless run that resulted in potentially the biggest heartbreak of any run I've ever attempted. But the story might have a happy ending after all. Because I did it all over again. And like every run before this one, 
the second attempt of an intentionally deathless run. I didn't trust the calculations. I didn't trust the numbers. I didn't trust anyone besides my own questionable instincts. And when I finally made my way back to Gita, I simply turned my brain off and sent out the second coming of Pyro the Skeledurge, who spammed a singular move and swept her entire team. I kid you not, it was truly that simple, which, if you ask me, makes it feel kinda worse. Sometimes you overthink yourself into oblivion, but in reality, the answer is usually pretty simple. It's better content to lose by being reckless than it is to win by being smart. <laughs>